All right, wonderful. Well, thanks everyone uh, for being with us, and uh, thanks Stefano for the introduction, and um, a particular thanks to the four presenters for giving us four really rich and interesting presentations. I've got the, the daunting task of in 10 minutes trying to sort of bring this all together into a single coherent discussion, um, so I'll do my best, um, but there was just so much in all four of these presentations that we obviously have a lot to, to get through. Um, so I think, I mean, in, 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 in some ways, all four of these uh, projects are addressing a kind of timeless question, which is why, why do protests uh, occur? Why does mobilization occur? Um, but they're doing so in really interesting ways because they're asking this question in the sort of current uh, 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 contemporary historical moment, right? And putting it into a global, putting that question into a global context, right? So um, we're living in this moment where um, protest appears to be on the rise um, over the last decade. Um, uh, Zakaria sort of uh, uh, alluded to this in, in the present, others as well. Um, now we need to be a little bit careful about sort of making big conclusions about global trends. Um, some of the data that suggests protest is on the wave has, has, has some biases and problems, you know, some frequency biases, but, but we're seeing this now across enough data sets and in enough different, you know, it's operationalized in enough different ways that we can, we can probably say conclusively that we're living in a global moment where protest is really um, at, at, at quite a high level. Well, it's not, say, unprecedented, but, but it is a, a sort of a moment um, uh, in which protest seems to be dominating and, and across the world in a variety of different contexts and regions. Um, and so these papers are, are sort of interrogating this question of why protest emerges um, in, in, in light of the various things that are going on around the world. So COVID-19, obviously a major factor, uh, particularly in the first paper. Um, economic changes, neoliberalism, um, and the changing nature of the global economy. Um, democratic backsliding and populism, right? So how are these forces, which we're all very attuned to, how are they shaping dynamics of protest and, and changing uh, the way in which mobilization occurs? Um, so questions of why protest occurs, but also what form is it taking? And how is that different than in earlier eras? Um, and then what kinds of impacts is it having, right? Are, are the kinds of questions that these papers are dealing with and, and I think are really exciting. Um, so I've got some some suggestions and thoughts for the for the four authors. I'm going to deal actually with um, the the um, uh, the first paper by Mortorano and all, and um, and then the third paper on Iraq together because they both take a grievance approach to to, to looking at protests. And I've got some thoughts about that. And then I'm going to look at uh, Zakaria and Alcinda's papers because they're both dealing with the question of of protest in Africa. Um, so on the on the 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 first two papers. Um, you know, because protest is a timeless question and it's been studied for so long, sometimes it's sort of difficult to, to deal with all of the existing arguments and literature that are, that are out there. Um, and, and, you know, both, I think both papers cited the, the original Ted Gurr relative deprivation thesis um, as motivation um, and, and, and are really building on that thesis. Um, I think it's important for both of these papers to think about some of the literature that's come between Gurr's thesis and what we're dealing with today because for a long time, grievance-based arguments really went out of fashion in social movement studies. And the reason that they went out of fashion is because they started to, people kind of made the argument that the, the correlation between where you see either absolute levels of grievances or relative levels of grievances, which was Gurr's original point, the, the correlations with protest actually weren't very high, right? And so people came in, social movement scholars came in and they said, well, grievances are important, but they're not the only thing. You actually need a lot of other things to make protest happen. You need resources, you need organizations, you need networks, right? We have the classic Manker Olson collective action problem that needs to be solved. So grievances are necessary, it was pointed out, but they're not sufficient. Right, for protests to occur. And I think both of these papers could do a little bit more to think about those kinds of critiques of the original grievances argument. Now, I think actually recently we've been seeing a resurgence of grievance-based explanations for protests. So in that sense, both of the papers, I think, maybe are part of a new wave or a new trend. But I do think for both of them that they need to think a little bit about what these, you know, these other aspects of mobilization that a whole generation of scholars have pointed out are really important. So for uh, the, the uh, Francesco and, and co-author's paper on uh, the United States and COVID-19, I think it's particularly important to think about the collective action problem and these sort of organizational dynamics of protest because we're talking about protest in the context of a, of a pandemic. 
when organization presumably should be very difficult, right, to accomplish. So I think the idea that inequality, you know, grievances around inequalities and lockdowns could be behind these protests is compelling, but there's more work to be done in explaining to us how these protests came about and what the organizational basis for, uh, or, or for, for, for creating this mobilization really was in these, in these counties that you're looking at. Um, another small question um, for that paper, um, is to think a little bit about, well, and, and I wonder if the data actually exists for this. I think it might, because I think you're using a version of the ACLA data set to, to look at this. But are the protests actually about inequality and about COVID, right? Because if thinking about, you know, having lived through COVID in the United States and seen a lot of protests in the places I was living and, and others as well, a lot of the protests that took place actually weren't about COVID. Um, so we had the Black Lives Matter movement taking place in the summer of 2020. And so I wonder if you can sort of get use maybe demand variables in the protest data that you have to get under a little bit, what are these protests really about? Because even if they're taking place in un unequal neighborhoods and unequal counties, it's not necessarily the case that they would be about COVID specifically. So I'd like to maybe uh, hear more about, about that if you have the data to answer that question. Um, uh, with Dan's presentation, I'm super interested in this paper. I'm doing research on Iraq and the Tishrin Thauda myself, so um, this was very exciting. A um, couple of small questions in addition to the, to the one I already mentioned about mobilization and organization. Um, is there a question on protest participation? I would love to see the same analysis on whether on who participated in protests, not just who supports protest. Potentially, sort of a higher threshold, right? Um, and maybe uh, uh, something interesting. You know, security. I would imagine would play into that dynamic as well. Um, I also think, again, getting back to this idea of sort of needing to engage with prior scholarship. I mean. One of the longest standing findings in the social movements literature is that the, the, the most aggrieved do not actually protest. And I think you're contributing to that and finding your findings align with that. But interestingly, most of those studies are about material deprivation. And so your paper comes in and brings security into the picture in a really interesting way. And so I would, I would bring that out more, right? And, and I think in that way, you're actually adding something new to what is kind of a, a pretty well-established finding in the field. Um, okay, let me turn to the two um, papers that deal with the, the question of protest in Africa. Um, and actually, there were some interesting ways in which these two presentations overlapped, which I thought was kind of exciting. Um, both of them are grappling with um, this recent protest wave that we've been seeing in Africa over the last decade. Both of them are grappling with the question of how this, the, the nature of protest during this wave um, is different, right? And I think there's some synergies between some of the conclusions you both are finding. These protests have been more horizontal. They have embraced uh, deliberately, in some cases, a decentralized uh, model of organization. They have eschewed formal politics, right? Um, Alcinda talked a lot about how there's a sort of disdain for formal politics in these protest movements. Um, and in some ways, both of these presentations reminded me a bit of the work of Asif Bayat and the concept of revolution, which he puts forward as an alternative to the sort of classic model of revolution. Um, and, and I see both of these pieces of work as sort of in, in some ways building on those concepts and ideas. Um, Alcinda's presentation brings up a really important problem with this type of, of, of mobilization. And this is a problem that we saw, of course, during the Arab Spring, which are a set of cases that I know quite well, which is what happens when these uh, uh, horizontally organized social movements actually achieve success and take power. Right? What do they do with that power? Because there's, a, there's, there's an internal contradiction built into these movements, which is that by sort of treating the, the, the political realm as, um, as, as corrupt and as uh, something that should be disdained, they end up with a major problem when they actually achieve their success and come to power and have to do the hard work of governing and, and engaging in politics and how to do that while maintaining the same set of principles. Um, I think the jury is still out on how this works and I think Alcinda raised some really provocative ideas from some of the cases she talked about, about how this might um, uh, 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 work successfully. Um, I, I have some, some concerns with Tunisia as a case of success or a case that bears this model out as sort of showing that it can work. Um, I think that the recent turn of events in Tunisia demonstrates really that, that um, there are some ways in which this type of politics can be co-opted for autocratic ends and um, shows really the limitations of um, this type of horizontal organizing um, it, when it comes to actually engaging in formal politics. So I would, I would kind of chalk that case up as more sort of 
um, an example of, of, of this type of, of, sort of mobilization sort of failing. Um, I think that the, the autocratic turn under Kai Saeed is, is, a, is a, um, a really problematic turn of events. And I think that, um, so we're still waiting, I think, to see some good success stories of how this form of mobilization can, can bring about um, really substantial and transformative politics. Um, I'm really excited by Zakari's present, uh, presentation and it sounds like maybe a book. It seems like it has that level of um, scope. Um, it, it, it is an impressive, uh, uh, the, the level of the kind of questions you're dealing with are very impressive. Um, I guess one suggestion I have is, you know, in classic, you know, comparative politics uh, mode, thinking more about variation. Um, you know, even that economist map that you put up, um, there are some, some white countries there where we don't see a lot of protests. So, why, right? Why are we seeing protest at such a high level in some countries of Africa and not in other countries, right? And maybe looking at that cross-national variation, sounds like maybe you're already thinking about sub-national variation, which I think is great, but thinking a little bit about the cross-national variation there can, can get us towards some, some, some answers to these big questions you're posing. Um, and then, uh, you know, a question for both for both papers is, is to thinking, think a little more about regime type, right? And, and, and Zakari had talked a little bit about this uh, in, in your explanation, right? The failures of democracy in Africa since the 1990s. But the cases you're bringing up are cases of autocracy and democracy, right? And we seem to be seeing protest across both sets of cases. My sense is the dynamics of protest differ a lot between autocracies in Africa and democracies in Africa. Um, and so I wonder if, you know, can we get a, can a single explanation account for both of those? Um, do we, are there some differences uh, in, in the nature of mobilization uh, depending on regime type? I think that would be an interesting um, question to wrestle with. Um, certainly your argument about the failure of political parties works well for explaining protest in the democracies of the continent, but, but not so well for the autocracies, right? So um, I would push you on that a little bit. Same thing for Alcinda, you know, how does the, the arguments that you're uh, working through differ according to the, the regime type? Um, and I think I'll leave it at that because we have 15 minutes left for Q&A. Thanks so much. Thank you, Gillian. Thank you for your uh, comments and thank you for your perfect timing. Uh, is it possible to have Alcinda on the big screen so that we don't forget about her? Uh, at least if she wants to, um, to join us and participate. So, uh, yes, do you want to move there so that you can actually face the audience? Uh, I'll stay here and direct the traffic. Yes, I already see a couple of hands. One there, two in the back. Yeah, we can we can start here. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for these uh, interesting presentations. Uh, uh, my question is for Francisco, and I'm Philip Verbin from the Université Libre de Bruxelles. Um, Francesco, I didn't understand how inequality was measured. Uh, I assume it's measured at the county level, and um, probably you have an, an income measure or a consumption measure. And so I, I was wondering if communities or counties are very, very poor, uh, but they're not unequal. Let's say everybody is poor. Uh, do they then turn up in, in your analysis? Uh, because um, it may be that they're just very poor, but not unequal. And then I would expect, nevertheless, a high level of protest because at a national level, they may be uh, at the bottom end of inequality, but you don't see it within county eh, because the majority or everybody is poor. So can you comment on that? Thank you. Yes, and there were two hands in, in the back. Okay. Uh, Tone Dirks, I'm with the University of Basel and uh, Swiss Peace. Um, I have a question for uh, Zach Mampili um, on because um, you, you talked about social movements and, and protest and, and the global order, obviously. Um, now, I was wondering uh, if you think about your, your other work on, on rebel groups. Um, there, I think there's quite a lot of literature that, that looks at uh, the links between rebel groups and uh, foreign powers. Um, so during the Cold War, in the post-Cold War period, where, where rebel groups would use certain language or 
um, be it Marxist, be it liberal, uh, to to get support. Um, and so you could say that maybe there was quite a clear relationship between what these groups were doing and this global order. Now, how would that work with the protest uh, movements you describe? Like who can they go to? Um, or is this more a sort of abstract thing where we see economic conditions change and there is some sort of response to that, but maybe not so, uh, not such a clear link as, 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 as with uh, the rebel groups that you looked at. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, <clears throat> I'm Daryl Sequeira. Um, I have a question as regards how the authorities should react against a protest which is unjustified. Uh, for example, those who protested against vaccination against corona, thereby endangering innocent individuals who want to protect themselves against getting infected. Another example would be a protest where uh, a group of people want to convert land into um, human use and destroy a rainforest, for example that would lead to a long-term decline in their development, but a short-term advantage. So there, here we have the need for specialized technical analysis of these issues and decisions according, based on those scientific technical analyses. Now, how does one deal with uh, sort of, shall we say, uninformed protesters who are short-term in their approach uh, maybe have vested interest or are instigated by other parties to protest and are really unjustified in their protest. Thank you very much of your very interesting and motivative presentations as well. My name is Irmeli Mustolahti. I work with the University of Eastern Finland and Especially, I was very happy that you were raising up this issue in relation to elite of civil society. And we are, in our own research, we talk about uh, uh, suitcase and briefcase NGOs and also these type of advocacy organizations. And for example, this case which you were having a picture from Tuara, from Tanzania. Uh, you don't really see the, these type of elite civil society or, or these so-called uh, uh, briefcase or suitcase NGOs there in the streets, but there is the young, uh, young men, young ladies who are so-called responsibilized to actually in those protests and, and movements. So how you how you see this? Uh, type of NGOs, which often are actually financed by donor aid, who are rather the, the responsibilizing the, the youth to actually in, in this protest. Do, yeah, do you want to reply to this first round of questions, or do you want to collect more? Please. We had some specific questions, other questions were directed to, to all of yes. you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you for the, the questions. Actually, before moving to Philip's question, I just wanted to mention something about what Kilian uh, raised before. And you are actually very right in uh, discussing about which type of protests we are analyzing. And we had this, this question too. And that's why I tried to mention, but I didn't specify in the presentation, that we actually look at COVID-related protests. So protests that have COVID as their main topic. And to compare with other types of, tr of uh, protests, we checked for 2020, year in which uh, Black Lives Matter protests were you know, uh, very relevant, actually the majority of protests in the US, and there were also protests related to the elections, to check if these stringency, this interaction between stringency of the measures and inequality affects also those protests, and we interestingly find that it doesn't. So it does not have an impact on protests related to Black Lives Matter or to the elections, presidential elections, but it does only relate to COVID-related protests. So just to 
And with regards to inequality, the question from, from Philip, um, yes, indeed, that it is income inequality. And it's a Gini coefficient from 2019 for each county. And But you are very right. In very poor counties, this might be uh, a problem because they might protest as well. So that's why we also tried with the measure of poverty. And interestingly, we found that there is no really a big impact of poverty on protest participation. Now, the reason for this, it might be complicated actually, um, uh, what might be, again, from anecdotal evidence, there is some uh, scientific evidence on the fact that, for example, inequality increased after the 1980 Spanish influenza because the lower bracket lost most of their income, so also an increase in poverty. So in that case, inequality and poverty went hand in hand. Well, in this case, maybe, uh, the increase in inequality is due to richer households getting richer thanks to or as a consequence of the pandemic. Maybe this could be a justification. However, I agree with you that we could explore a bit more this, this, uh, this uh, element of the analysis. Thank you. I can leave the floor. Yeah, thank you. Um, great questions. Let me let me take these. Uh, uh, well, let me start with the the question about unruly protests and protests that are uh, articulating agendas that we may not be comfortable with. Um, and I, I think the question I would ask is, you know, how much do you believe in democracy, right? Um, and if you believe in democracy, then you have to accept that there are people who have views that are anathema to us, right? I don't want to romanticize protest. I don't want to romanticize activism. The groups that I'm interested in. Uh, can as easily espouse agendas associated with the left, uh, of which I'm a part of, uh, as they can with the right, right? And that's just a reality. But I tend to support protest because I tend to believe in democracy. And I think that the nature of electoralism that has been implemented in African countries and, and across the world, I would say, um, has really reduced our capacity for choice, right? I'm an American citizen. Uh, I feel like I have no choice in the political process. Um, and so I participate in protests because at least I can find a way to express myself democratically, even if there are views that the political parties are not going to champion ever, right? Um, and so I think it's important that to me, as somebody who believes in democracy, that we accept that protests may articulate things that we don't like, uh, but they should be allowed to, 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 to move forward, right? Um, and that may differ if you don't think democracy is desirable, and I certainly respect that position as well. To the, to, the, to the more uh, specific questions, you know, I think the question of internationalism is hugely important here, right? And I think my work on, on violent groups deeply informs my, my work on, on social movements, right? Um, because I think increasingly I, I'm not convinced there's a divide between the two. I think the divide between violent and nonviolent activism uh, is largely an artifact of, of government preferences, right? Um, what I have seen is that with the groups that I study, uh, people move between these two forms of activism, not based on any sort of moral uh, agenda, which is how we often frame it, right? Uh, but rather on tactical or strategic ones. And so I know personally people who have participated in violent groups uh, who then become nonviolent activists and back and forth, right? And their decision to participate in one or the other is not, uh, as it's often framed, uh, the result of their personal moral rectitude. Um, but rather the context in which they're operating at a particular moment and their calculation, both individual and whether or not violent or nonviolent activism is warranted in that given moment. Right? Um, and so I'm, 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 I'm more interested in the synthesis that tries to bring together these two analyses. In the social sciences, at least in the West, uh, we have a field of, of, of conflict studies and then we have a field of you know, nonviolent social movement studies. Um, and I, I think that division is increasingly nonsensical. Right. Um, so to the question of internationalism, I think, you know, if we look at it historically, right, part of what I'm trying to do here is, is to, to think back to earlier periods of, of global disruption. So the last time we had these major waves of global uprisings, 1940s, right, in the context of the anti-colonial struggles, uh, 1980s and 90s in the context of the fall of the, Cold, uh, the, fall of the Soviet Union and, and the end of the Cold War, right? Are we living through a similar period today? Now, of course, I think to come to, to the, the, the Killian's points, um, you know, that makes it difficult. You know, it's hard to assess in the moment whether we're living through a similar period of global disruption. But I have a sense that maybe we are, right? Um, and that necessitates a, a global response. Um, it necessitates coordination across borders. And we have not seen 
uh, to the extent that existed in the 1940s and in the 1980s and 90s, the same level of, uh, of, of coordination across borders. I think in the African context, it's starting to emerge. There's a very interesting network called the Afriki Network, which has tried to bring together many of the leading social movements in Africa. Um, you know, I have worked with them. I've tried to get funding for them. <laughs> uh, I have failed to do that um, because foundations don't want to support social movements, right? They prefer to support NGOs, which brings me to the, the question of what role are NGOs playing in this process? Um, and I think that what I wasn't able to discuss in my presentation, again, I think there's good reason uh, to push back against the tendency to individualize activism, right? To create these heroes uh, who are, you know, uh, centered in our stories of these social movements. This is why I'm, I'm leaning towards a more structural account, right? Because if we, if we take a structural account of what's unfolding, uh, we can situate the NGO within these larger structural processes, right? And at a core level, the NGO is not capable of bringing about transformative change. And that is a structural condition. Right? NGOs have to operate according to the laws of the country in which they are based. And that means that if you're a foreign foundation right, who's trying to give money to activists and you end up giving money to an NGO instead, uh, you've already sort of shaped the field. Right? You've already determined that you're going to favor one type of political action over the other. And that one type of political action will happen to be the one that fits within the domestic legal order and in essence reinforces unjust political systems. And that's a structural reality. It's not a moral failing. I don't blame people who work for NGOs. Those are my friends, right? I'm from a middle class educated background. They're my family members. Like, I don't fault them uh, for working for NGOs, but I do not conflate what they do with the kinds of uprisings that I'm interested in. They have a different politics. Right. And that operates both at the domestic level, but is often determined by these global forces. So part of our NGO industry in the West is to take activists right, and transform them into NGOs. Uh, and that necessarily involves transforming their politics to participate in systems that I think we all would agree are fundamentally messed up politically and economically. So we need to be able to talk about this. Right? We need to be able to discuss how we've arrived <laughs> at a situation uh, where we are reinforcing systems that we recognize as being problematic, rather than actually providing support uh, to, again, uh, uh, the people who I think are, are the most impacted by global capitalism, and the ones who are most likely uh, to go out into the streets to protest things like a, price, a bread price increase, right? Uh, uh, attempts to take away their land. In Tanzania, you know, these Mtwara protests are not alone. It's happening now with the Maasai in, in the northern part of the country as well, as the government tries to take away their land in the name of tourism. Um, you know, these, and I think everyone in here can, can think of these cases, right? But because their activism does not fit our preordained models for how they should be operating, uh, we tend to dismiss them, or even worse, I think this is the logic of philanthrocapitalism, to discipline them in the context of the NGO. Uh, and I think that's really, really problematic. So I'm, I'm much more interested in a different type of internationalism, right? The type that we saw like during the anti-colonial struggles where it was really a movement to movement type of transnationalism or internationalism rather than a foundation or, or government to, to movement uh, uh, internationalism, right? I know that's abstract, but I'm happy to talk about this more. Thank you. Daniel, do you want to respond to the comments or to the questions? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> No, I'm good. Uh, everything you said um, resonates. I took copious notes. It's very early stage research, so and, and we'll talk about, you know, data and other issues pertinent to Iraq. Okay. Um, so we ran out of time, um, but I would like to hear if Alcinda wants to comment or respond to, to some of the questions. Well, maybe just a comment, uh, given that we don't have a, uh, much time. Uh, I, I just wanted to say that I really think that the central question, um, it's really about this global situation, you know, just to echo Zach uh, Mampili on this, because also what I wanted to do with this presentation, which I didn't have much time, was to look at beyond the street protests, but also beyond the local. And what I've been observing with my research is that these movements are uniting beyond the, 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 the borders of their own countries. For example, the Afriki Muinda that Zach mentioned, uh, 
it's it's a pan african organization and it's it's it brings up a number of movements because people are realizing that the problem is not a leader and uh, in a paper that i wrote about this i talk about these movements going beyond the leader for example when ben ali or omar bashir went it wasn't enough for them to go because there is a whole system that is behind them that perpetuates itself. But it's also beyond the local because it, there is an international system that creates constraints to these movements. And they are realizing that it's beyond, it's a much bigger issue than a particular government, a particular leader, but it's a political system that they're dealing with. And my interlocutors in the field, they were very clear about rejecting a particular system. This idea of party politics, this idea of party elites, this idea of a civil society that is an elite. Why not go through to grassroots? Why not start from scratch? So these are some of the ideas that I see emerging. And um, thank you for mentioning Tunisia uh, um, uh, on, um, on this. But my view is that Tunisia is a really interesting case and we should look at it more closely because precisely what Kai Sayed was doing was to try to break the very system, which is global which is this idea of political parties, this idea of political parties around the elites, the oligarchies that are created. And they are also moving into civil society, which is serving that. And so how to break that, how to make uh, uh, municipalities and grassroots as the center of politics. You know, just think about it. If a parliamentarian is, doesn't have to be from a political party and comes from, uh, the municipality, somebody who's elected at the local level and has to respond to the local level, it completely changes the dynamic. It's true that he might now have been kind of taking a more autocratic turn, but it's interesting also to see what the Tunisian uh, 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 public opinion says about it. It's, it's most of most people, especially the my interlocutors, are really keen for Sayed to move on. They say, you know, you are challenging the system and they will not let you operate. He was in, 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 in government for a couple of years. Everything he was proposing would not pass in parliament. It was blocked exactly because he was going against the people who are in parliament. So, you know, it's true that he's becoming an autocrat. It's true, that, but it, I think there is a lot to be unpacked there and there is interesting things going on. And I think we should just be open and, 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 and see where it takes us. And, uh, and as I ended in my, in my presentation, you know, only time will tell, but uh, something is brewing that is, that is you know, we're living in a very interesting moment, I think. Thank you.